when we look at the infant church today, which we will, you can turn to Acts chapter 2 if you want to. When we look at this infant church today, we will see a baby that, to use a cliche, hit the ground running. I mean, this baby took off and began to do things that only adults could do. And so, as we read these verses, chapter 2, verses 41 through 47, continuing in our study of the book of Acts, we will find a baby who just learned to run before it learned to walk. So, those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and had everything in common. So they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Very simple, very easy to see. We're going to see four things, four characteristics about the early church, about the baby church. As we are looking at these four things, you need to consider what Southside looks like compared to that church. And then, of course, you need to consider what you look like as a part of this congregation. Because the church only goes as the people who make up the congregation goes. So the church is going to do what the people of the church do. So that's what I want us to look at, and just plain, simple things that, that are there for all of us to see. The first thing is, in verse 41, we see that they accepted the message. The message we're talking about will be the message that Peter preached. Um, Peter, being the apostle who did the most speaking at this particular time, he had things to say, and the people accepted what he had to say. And I want to talk a little bit about what that looks like. When, when we accept the message, what does it look like? First of all, it looks like a group of people that have received the message in faith. They received it in faith. The word there is believed. And that's the way that we have to receive the message. We have to see that it comes only by faith. Now, what, what's the big deal about that? Well, one reason we come to church is because faith comes by, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you hear the word of God, it increases your faith. It helps you understand what God wants you to do. A church is simply a body of people who have accepted the message. And the message, of course, for you and I today is the Word of God. As these who were with Jesus, eyewitnesses to what Jesus did, lived with Him, walked with Him, they became apostles, and as they spoke, some of these things were written down for you and I, canonized later, and put in what we have as our Bible. It is the Word of God that these people were receiving. They, they weren't receiving some set of ideas. You know, you go to institutions of higher learning and, and you, you often are encountered with things that you've never heard before from some very intelligent people and who speak it in such a way that make you want to absolutely believe everything they say. But that's just a set of ideas. That's just a man's thoughts. What these people were receiving was the Word of God. It was coming from these people who had been with Jesus for three years and had walked with him and heard him teach. It was not an empty set of rules or principles or some human philosophy, some religion based upon that, but rather they were receiving the word of God. They were receiving the very revelation of God himself. Now God had revealed himself to his disciples in the form of Christ Jesus. And as those 12 that had followed him, which became 11 and then 12 again, they were the ones who were to lead this, this little baby church that was about to take some very giant steps. Peter was the spokesman for the disciples, and he was the one proclaiming this word. And these things that we have read last week and that we'll continue to read in other places where Peter and some of the other apostles speak, it becomes the word of God for you and I. God had spoken to the world through his son Jesus, and the early believers had accepted that message. The first characteristic about receiving the word in faith is that you heard it, and it was the Word of God, and you knew it was the Word of God. Well, here's the thing. Every one of you that comes and sits on Sunday mornings, you hear the Word of God. 
But here's something else that that early church did. One reason they were taking giant steps instead of little baby steps is they accepted the Word of God. Something different about accepting it than hearing it, and I want to explain that to you for just a minute. There were those people who readily received this message. They knew it was from God, and when we say they accepted it, we mean that it's not just that they come and they listen to it. You know, one place in, in the Old Testament prophets, the, the Bible talks about the people who have heard the word so much that they have big ears. And I got this picture of Dumbo-looking people because they hear the word and they hear the word and they hear the word. And we, we're like Dumbo the elephant with these giant ears. We've heard so much, but we don't accept it. Accepting it means that it, that it makes a difference in our life. And when the Bible says that these people accepted the word of God, this was the true body of believers. They don't just hear it or listen to it. They put it into practice. They're not just present to join the crowd because in the South it's the social thing to do. They're here because they're hungry. They're here because they want to hear the word. And when they hear the word, they want to make application of the word in their own life. They don't sit with wandering minds or closed hearts. They sit ready to hear. I remember one of my early churches as a youth minister, probably, well, the worst I've ever heard, pulpiteer. I mean, the guy, he, he could not preach a lick. But he was incredibly intelligent and a tremendous theologian. And I got to tell you, the five years I sat under this man, and he, he himself said, no, I'm not a preacher. He said, I know the word, but I don't have the personality. I, he just did not. I mean, he was as dry as could be. But when he preached, there were those, and I, I, admittedly, there were only a few, but there were those who had notebook and pen. We didn't have iPads and those things back in that day. We had notebooks and pens ready to write down what he had to say. His delivery was horrific. His content was incredible. And so we went with the idea we're going to hear something. Glenn Pippins is going to say something today because he said something every week. That's the kind of heart people need to come with. You come with the idea that, Lord, I'm giving everything I have to you today, and I know you're going to give me something in return. And that's what God does for us. And so these people, they, they welcomed this message. They didn't, they didn't just hear it. They accepted it. They welcomed it. Though there were, there were those who just jumped into this message. Now, when you hear the word accepted, and some of your different translations use a, use a, a different word, the, the word that when was written by Luke in this book of Acts, and, and the, the, when they would read it in the first century, those people understood this as readily welcoming. We hear the word accepted, and we just think about accepting something. But, but it, it has more of an understanding. When Luke wrote this, and these readers were reading it, they said it, it is uh, it is, we want this word, we want this message, we readily receive it, we can't wait to get it. And those who were saved that day, those 3,000, were those who were hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and when the word began to be proclaimed, then they became excited about it, and they recognized it as truth. We've seen this happen all over the world. We've seen it happen in our little village, where we've had people come and say, I understand that, that the... Uh, and this is literally what they said, that the white man has come to bring us the message of life. And we say, yes, we have. And then others, I have friends, Dale Smith down in Deer Park, who was traveling up a river, and he gets off the boat with a, a, a case of Bibles, and a man comes running up to him and says, I've been having a dream over and over again about the white man who's going to bring me the book that contains the words of life. Are you that man? And Dale said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Those people are ready for it. They are hungry for it. Now, as a church, are we hungry? Are we just listening? I mean, I don't literally see Dumbo ears out here, but really, do we have, do we have a bunch of Dumbos sitting in the congregation? Because we often hear and we listen, but we don't accept and we don't welcome it. One of the questions that I'm asked often by new believers or by people who, who have just now started coming to church is that it seems like that most of the people who come to the front when we give a formal altar call, which we don't do every time, but when we give a formal altar call, it seems that sometimes the, those are the same people coming forward. Are they just terrible sinners and have to repent every week? When the fact of the matter is, it's usually the more spiritual people that make the decisions because they're hearing from God and they're trying to change their life to be more like Jesus. 
And so they are welcoming the message. And so when God speaks, they respond. And they don't have to do it publicly. It just helps. We've been doing it that way for 50 years. I don't necessarily know that that's an absolute perfect way to do it. But it helps. It gives people a spiritual marker. It gives them a place to nail it down. It gives them something to remember to say, I committed on April the 7th that this and this and this was going to change in my life. That's what welcoming the word means. Not everyone present received it. Some were there for the wrong reasons. Some were there with closed minds. Some were there just to ridicule those who were, who were following God's plan. Others were there because it was a socially acceptable thing to do. Everybody was there. I mean, my goodness, 3,000 of them got saved. So how many thousands of people were there? We don't know. But we know that there were people there who were just there because. And that's no different than today. I remember as a youth minister hearing this, and I couldn't believe my ears. A man came to me, and he had three children in the youth department, and he told me he was leaving the church. We ran about 200 at the time, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to First Baptist. This was in West Monroe, Louisiana. I said, why? And he said, well, I have better business opportunities there. I went, really? Really? And I, I, it just blew me away. I, I didn't even know what to say. I was, now I know a lot to say. But then I just couldn't believe I, I heard my ears. I was thinking, my first thought was, you're lost. I mean, I didn't say that, thank the Lord. But that was really what I thought. You're just lost. Some people do that. I, I know it may be foreign to you, but it happens. But those who, who received God's word, who welcomed it, they became the first body of believers, the first church. They, they received it in faith, and it changed everything about the church and because of the way they received it they didn't take baby steps they took huge steps three thousand people were saved that very first day they received it in faith they also received it in obedience and this helped them take those big steps the word baptized there baptizo just tells us all about um, these people wanting to identify with jesus now obviously you think about it did peter baptize all three thousand of course not Probably the 120 that were there helped with the baptisms. But the fact is, they wanted to identify with Jesus immediately, so they asked to be baptized, and they were baptized and added to the church. They were following God obediently. They heard the word, they received the word, they welcomed the word, and then they obeyed it, and it changed everything about them. In just the space of a few verses, we see what happens when people trust Christ for their salvation. And, and if you go back just a few verses that we talked about last week, you see that, first of all, people recognize their need. They know that they're sinners. And all of us in this building, no matter how good you are, there is sin in your life. And God is so holy and so perfect that he cannot tolerate sin. Absolutely no sin gets into heaven. We have to recognize our need that we cannot get into heaven on our own. But then we have to recognize God's gift and that's the word that Peter and these apostles are proclaiming. That is the word that you and I, as a New Testament church, need to be proclaiming to a lost world. The gift is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I may be forgiven. We recognize our need and we receive God's gift, and then we obey the message. The Bible tells us to repent. The Bible tells us that if we call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. That's the obedience that comes. And when you have that, that message received and you obey what Jesus says about the message, it changes your life. You commit yourself to him and nothing is the same. And many of us have done that. We are, we are at the place where, where we accept the message. But that's not the only thing they, they did. In verse 42, we have several places to that show us that they made a commitment. And first of all, it says very plainly, they made a commitment to the Word. And we're talking again about the Word of God. And we spent some time in the first point about that, so I won't dwell on it. But we have the idea here that these new converts are, are to immerse themselves in the Word. The apostles' teaching was central to this new church. All they had was the Old Testament. They didn't have all that we had today in the form of the New Testament. God was just revealing this to them. And so when these apostles taught, they listened. There was, there was definite understanding that these guys were the ones that were speaking for God at this particular point. It was central to the content of what was to be studied. These eyewitnesses of Jesus had, had done uh, all the things that Jesus had done. They had seen him do it. And, and the Holy Spirit would remind them 
of the things that Jesus had done and taught them. And they would tell the people, and this would become our scripture that we read today. Second Peter tells us about that when it says, Dear friends, Peter's writing this, of course. This is the second letter I've written to you in both. Uh, and he said, I awaken your pure understanding with a reminder so that you can remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. Peter knew that he was speaking for God. He knew that Jesus had called him to come follow him for a reason. And as a result of that, he was able to tell people what God was like and what God wanted them to do. From the beginning of the early church, those who uh, devoted themselves to hearing and studying and learning what the apostles had to teach were the ones who helped the church take giant steps. Now, I want to I kind of indict us a little bit here. We need to be more committed to the word. The reason that we, and I'm not just talking about Southside. I'm talking about the church with a capital C. The reason that we are not taking giant steps anymore is because we're not committed to the word. And I'm sad to say that as we sit here today, there are denominations who do not believe that the word of God is the infallible, inerrant word of God. There are some that I used to read that I would never in my life think would say things like this, but talking about certain social issues, and they would say, well, the issue is not if the Bible is the word of God. The issue is it relevant for man anymore. I mean, these are preachers, theologians. And we have so many who are questioning the validity of the word. Now, you and I look at those guys and those smart people who write those things, like maybe, maybe God didn't mean what we thought he meant. And, and let me tell you this. It, the Bible doesn't mean something it's never meant. That's why you need to study the Bible and you need to know the history of, of who it's being told to and why they're being told that and what it is they're being told. Because let me say, if it didn't mean it back when God said it originally, then it doesn't mean that for us today. You understand what I'm saying? The principles are the same. So... What I'm trying to get us to see here is we're not committed to the word. We don't know the word. And because of that, we are robbing the church of the opportunity to take giant steps. I am amazed. And look, and I've asked some of you this question recently. I am amazed at the percentage of people, leaders in the church, that I say, are you in the word every day? And they say no. While I appreciate their honesty, I am becoming incredibly concerned. How, how in heaven's name do we think we're going to reach people and, and take giant steps for God if we're not in the word? I, I am not infallible. If the 30 to 35 minutes you sit under my preaching and teaching each week is the most you get of the word, you're in sad shape. And you don't know what I'm saying. You don't know if it's true or not. I am imploring you to get in the word. I don't mean to be just rude, although I am most of the time. This is not a social club. This is not a place for you to come and make friends. That's just a side benefit. This is a place for you to come and to publicly acknowledge that you are selling yourself out to Jesus Christ. And we so don't know what that means anymore. These people that we're talking about today were in danger of losing their very lives. What is the setting of Acts chapter 2? What city are we in? We are in Jerusalem. The capital of the Jewish nation. The place where all the Jews came to gather for the Passover, which... Many of them were there for. And now Pentecost, which the ones that didn't live there had stayed for. And these people are saying, we are the fulfillment of Judaism. Listen, these guys weren't standing up and saying, hey, all you Jews are wrong. You got it wrong. They were standing up and saying, listen to me. We have the fulfillment of Judaism in Jesus Christ. They weren't anti-Jewish. They were saying we had the fulfillment. But that was dangerous. They could have been killed as Many of them were. These folks were committed to the word. I'm asking you, imploring you, start reading the word. Oh, I don't know where to start. 
go to the website, southsidelufkin.org. You don't have to start at Genesis chapter 1-1. Pick up where we are. Every day is listed there for you. You don't even have to read it yourself. There's a little speaker icon you can click on, and you can sit there, and somebody will read it to you. That's cheating, but it helps. Hey, you want your life to change? You want to see thousands of people added to the fellowship of the church? And we, we, we don't want that here. I mean, we can't handle that here. If we had 1,000 people show up today, we'd be in trouble. Well, we might room for them. We'd figure out how to do it. There you go. Set a speaker out there and y'all go sit in your car. Then I'd hear you're listening to the ball game instead of the sermon. <laughs> Point is, we would see things happen that we don't normally see happen. Because we are not committed to the word, we don't really know what God wants us to do. A lot of the things that people need counsel on are very readily explained in the word of God. There are some things you don't have to pray about. What? Yeah. Literally, some people come and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm praying about witnessing to my neighbor. I'm going, mm-mm. No. What? No. Go witness to your neighbor. You don't pray about that. God's already said do it. In the Word, he said do it. When the things are listed there in the Word, you don't need to pray about doing it. You may pray for favor. You may pray for God to make it easy. You may pray for God to give you great opportunity to share with your neighbor. But don't pray about whether to or not when it's already done. If you're in the Word, a lot of those things are answered. A lot of the issues that we deal with as human beings are covered in the Word of God. All right, so now I've got to move quickly. Not only were they committed to the Word, but that was first and foremost. They were committed to fellowship. Again, when this word koinonia was used, it, it has a lot more to it than you and I think of fellowship. When we hear church fellowship or fellowship meal, we think of a potluck dinner. We think of getting together, maybe playing a game or having a little fellowship. That's not at all what that meant. It did mean coming together, but it had the idea when Luke wrote the word koinonia, it had the idea of close personal relationships. There is a statistic about churches and people who leave churches. It is this, that if you have seven close friends in your family of faith, your local body of believers, it is very difficult for you to leave your church. And that is true. Because those are the people you go to, the people you talk to. And some of you have been involved in churches where you've struggled and you've had some issues, some biblical reasons for, for needing to leave a church, and it's killed you because you've had friends there, close friends. That's the kind of fellowship that, that Luke is trying to get us to understand that these people were committed to. And if you look at it, it says they met together how often? Every day. That's fine, Miss Sue. Feedback's not so bad. At least I know you're listening. Every day they met together. And, and that's the kind of relationships that Jesus wants us to have. Honestly, when you get to a point in your life where you are sold out to Jesus, your family of faith, which hopefully includes your biological family, your family of faith will become more important to you than your biological family. Now, most of the time it includes both. Many of you know my family situation, and if something happened to, to Missy and I at the same time, I would rather my family of faith take care of my issues than my biological family. I love them, spent time with them this week, but we're very different people. Jesus said it like this when he was talking about how things were going to change and how this fellowship was going to be so close. He said, I give you a new commandment that you need to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's why we continue to strive to be a family. Well, we're not running 20 anymore. We're not running 100 anymore. We're not even running 200 anymore. But we are trying, as we grow larger, to grow smaller. That's why small groups are so important. Because coming and sitting in here is not real intimate. They committed themselves to fellowship. They committed themselves to the breaking of bread. That's Luke's way of saying the Lord's Supper. Praying and the Lord's Supper were a regular part, regular part of the meetings in the early church. Get this, 
I mean, really. They would come together as a church. They would have the Lord's Supper. They would pray. But then sometimes they would go to the house, as it says that, that they were meeting in each other's homes. And at that point, they would make sure they focused on Jesus and they would pray together. All the time. You get together to talk about the ball game. You get together to go hunting. You get together to do whatever. But yet we still spend time praying because we want Jesus to be at the forefront. That's what he's telling us. That's the kind of, kind of things that this baby church did because it has prayer there as well. He committed himself to prayer. And things happened as a result of prayer. They made a commitment to the word, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And they, but they didn't even stop there. Already we, we've seen what these folks have done. Okay, they accepted the message. They made a commitment. But then in the next few verses, we find out that these, they, they went so far in what they were trying to do to teach you and I, they lived out their belief. And I'm not talking about telling people where you went to church. If you've been in East Texas very long, you go and you share your faith. And my, my entry phrase is usually, are you part of a church? That's usually how I begin to share the gospel because almost everybody, almost without exception, everybody in East Texas has a church home. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm waiting for somebody to say, oh yeah, I go to Southside. And I'm going to say, oh, you know the preacher? <laughs> okay, you laugh, but in church softball, we were playing a team one time and um, I was playing second base, and guy was on second. He'd just gotten a double, and I was just talking to him. We were in Dallas in the state tournament, and I said, hey, man, who's y'all's preacher? Hey, Ralph, who's the preacher at this church? I mean, that's the way we are. Everybody is a part of a church. So let me ask you, let me tell you this. When you ask somebody where they go to church, don't consider that witnessing because they're going to have a church home. Let that be the entry point to saying, okay, great. So that means that there's been a time in your life where you've sold yourself out to Jesus Christ. And watch how the conversation changes. Well, I don't know about that. And then you can either be prophetic or merciful, depending on your giftedness. Well, you're not going to heaven then, prophet. Or let me tell you how I can help you with that. Merciful. I choose prophetic. I don't do that, really. Only out of condition, though. That's what I want to say. But these guys lived out their belief. It changed who they were. And, and it wasn't just a church membership kind of thing. The Bible says in verse 43 that, that their belief ushered in wonders and signs. They saw all kind of miracles happen. These are the things that testified that these apostles were who they said they were. It wasn't just enough for them to say, hey, we have the message of life. And then they started saying things like, let me show you that we have the message of life. In addition to their worshiping together, these believers became actively involved in the work of the Lord. And let me say to you, one of the real differences, not only in, in their commitment to the word, but another real difference in the church then and the church now is that primarily today we have a spectator sport in Christianity. We have celebrity pastors that thousands of people flock to hear. And everybody loves to say, well, I'm a part of this church or that church when it's a massive, world-renowned church. That's not the key. The key is not that we have thousands of people coming to listen. The key is that we have thousands of people going out to join in the work of the gospel. That's what these people did. They came together. They heard what these apostles had to say. They went out and worked it. They lived out their belief. We're hurting there. We're hurting in that area as well. The same language used here about signs and wonders is the exact same phrase that Luke used in chapter 2, verse 22, just a few verses ahead of where we are, to talk about the apostles' signs and wonders. He's saying, look, the people did the same thing the apostles did. They lived out their belief and signs and wonders accompanied them. So their beliefs ushered in those, those wonders and signs. Their belief also brought them together. It brought them together doctrinally. Another thing that we have today, and as we are comparing today's church to the early church, um, another thing that we have today is most people don't give a rip about doctrine. They just don't. 
They're more concerned about how the music sounds or the presentation of the, of the sermon. Do I like it? Is he funny? Is he going to put me to sleep? Or, and I'm going to tell you, for years and years and years, I was intentionally trying to make no one laugh. And that was wrong, but, but I never, never tried to crack a joke or make anybody smile because I didn't think it was appropriate. But that's what we base where we go to church on more than anything today. I, I, I love it when, when, when people are concerned about doctrine. I love it when folks have asked me, well, preacher, I'm not real sure where you got that. And look, if I can't back it up, I don't need to be saying it. You can ask me about anything I say, and I will tell you why I said it. These guys in the New Testament, that early baby church, they were, they were brought together doctrinally. It was Jesus Christ. It was him crucified. He was resurrected and he took away their sin and they knew that and they had received the Holy Spirit and they were excited about sharing it with other people. Doctrinally they were brought together. But they were also brought together communally. Now here's, here's the deal. We see this passage where they, they brought everything in and, and I want you to be clear here. First of all uh, when you have preachers saying hey bring me whatever you have and you know, that's just wrong. The biblical thing is you go sell it and you bring the money. Now, if you give something to the church, whether it's property or whatever, if we don't donate it immediately to somebody in need, then the church should sell it. We're not in the business of, of getting a bunch of stuff. That's just what this teaches us. But we look at this and we often say, well, well why, why did they do that? Why don't we do that? Why don't we have all things in common and, and give to everyone who has need? And, you know, some people even think that sounds like communism. It's not. It was not compulsory it was voluntary you don't have to do it if you don't want to but let me tell you why this happened in this particular instance and that this is not the model for the entire church for the rest of eternity what had happened was you know 50 days earlier or 50 days before um, uh, Pentecost they had all come for the Passover some people made the journey to Jerusalem for the Passover wanted to stay for Pentecost and so they didn't go home Many of them had made plans for the time that they were going to be in Jerusalem. How are we going to eat? Where are we going to stay? Well, after all this Jesus stuff took place, they didn't want to go home. They had found Jesus. There were 120 of them, plus shortly thereafter there were 3,000. They were intrigued by all of this that Jesus was doing, and then the crucifixion and the resurrection, and then hanging around after that. They had all those days, those 40 days plus, that they had not accounted for. They were hungry. They had to have a place to stay. And so these people said, look, these folks are here. They want to hear what the apostles have to say. I'll sell a piece of property and give the money and we'll make sure that everybody has something to eat. This, this is often believed to be a one-time deal where they were just doing that to take care of the people who were there. But what we, we have together communally is a mission. We have a mission to reach the lost with the gospel. We have a mission to take care of all the things that God's asked us to take care of. We have a mission that God has given us that brings us together. And we are all to be a part of that. Now, um, I, I, I'm terrible at this. When we stopped passing the plate um, several years ago, I, I told the finance team that twice a month I'd remind people how we give. Somebody came to my office and it was funny. He was very serious. He said, how do you give to this church? Let me tell you how you give to this church and I'll tell you why. There are boxes in the back right behind that pole right there and there's one over here on the wall and there's one by the office up front. And that's how you give to this church. Giving is a vital part of worship. It brings us together communally. And listen, we don't hoard money, but we spend it like crazy. What do we spend it on? Oh, I'm leaving for Africa day after tomorrow. We have, we'll be starting a church in Colorado uh, soon at the end of the summer. We work in Mexico City on a regular basis. We're looking for other places as well that this little church can send people to go and be missionaries through, not just through the cooperative program, which is the greatest missionary sending agency in the history of Christianity. We give our percentage to that. We give a large percentage of our um, undesignated funds to the cooperative program. We support it. Over 5,000 missionaries are supported by that cooperative program. But we also want to be missionaries. And so that's how we use our money. Nothing is exorbitant here. You're free to look at the budget anytime. It's, it's out there once a month. You can see it. But we ask you to do it that way. It, it builds community when you pray. The Bible is very clear. It says that each man should give as God has purposed in his heart to give. So you pray. You ask God, what should I give to this church? You have to think about it before you get here. If you don't think of it, and I appreciate the folks who come in and say, hey, I, I'm trying to give and don't know how. That means they're thinking about it. If you're thinking about it, you know what to do. And we want you to, to plan it, ask God. He tells you what to do. We don't want you to give because the plate's passed. And so, 
That sometimes cost us. It does. We probably would get some money that we normally wouldn't get. But it ne- wouldn't necessarily be biblical. So that's how you give to this church. That brings us together communally. Um, it helps take care of the financial needs. We have benevolence just like they have. That's what this is all about. That's what brings us together is, is that we live out our belief and we understand that nothing we have is ours anyway. But in verse 46, we find that, we find that funny word, that everyday word again. Their belief not only, not only brought them to live out their, uh, their belief in, in a way like we've talked about with the signs and wonders and it brought them together um, communally, but also it compelled them to meet every day with other believers. I love the middle part, really, of verse, uh, or the end of verse 46, where it says they kept it simple. I, I, we miss that as well, don't we, church? If I Don't raise your hand, but if I ask you to, to do this, how many of you say your life is simple? <laughs> Not very many of us. And one of the things that we get taunted about the most are, are one of the things that amazes the people in the village of Adara is how complicated our life is. You don't really have a lot of time to sit and talk to people? No, it drives me crazy, you know, when I'm over here for two weeks and I sit for eight hours a day talking. It's not who we are as Americans. He said, your life is complicated. Yes, it is very complicated. Says a man who has no access to running water or electricity and lives in a mud hut. They do have ten roofs now. They are moving up in the world. They now have corrugated tin roofs. Almost everybody does. Which just means when you go in there in April, when it's 105 outside, it's 120 inside. Come in the house. It's a little cool out here. No, chief, let's sit out here in the shade. They kept life simple. And as a result of that, look at, the, look at verse 47, the first part of 47. What does it say they were doing? Praising God. I love that. And then as a result of all of those things, you know, they believed the message, they lived out their belief. The Bible says in verse 47, they saw results. These final two statements show significant results in the presence of this regularly meeting, money-sharing, miracle-working, Bible-studying, God-praising group of people. It says first, the watching community was favorably impressed. The The believers were enjoying the favor of all people is what it said. It said also the watching community was coming to faith. The Lord added to their number daily who were being saved. And these are two measurable results of any church that's living like the early church. People like what they see and people want to be a part of what they see. We're kind of far apart from that too. Our world is looking at us, looking at us with skepticism. And here's the thing. Notice who got the credit for all these salvations. They didn't say Peter was a great preacher. They didn't say, oh, the miracles drew all these people. They didn't say it was the manifestation of the Spirit. They said God, the Lord, added to their number daily. The Jerusalem church experienced both qualitative and quantitative growth. And we should be eager for this same result. And there are some always looking for this result, but many are trying to take shortcuts A lot of church leaders flock to church growth seminars. We have seeker-sensitive churches, churches, purpose-driven churches, transformational churches, viral churches, emergent church, organic church, simple church, irresistible influence church, and now one of the big deals is reformed church. I have been here over 19 years and have tried not to have the schizophrenic approach to church growth. We've tried to be consistent because I believe with all my heart, it doesn't matter what church you are, you can be any of those churches as long as you're a healthy church. Healthy things grow. Doesn't matter if it's a plant, a person, anything that's organic that is healthy grows. And so that's what we've tried to focus on. Making disciples, making healthy disciples, and it changes everything. Let me ask you this question, and I'm closing with this. What are you? What are you, as an individual, what are you doing to make this church healthy? 
For some of you, it is, I'm just getting started. I'm coming. I'm listening. And I'm learning. Be blessed. Others of you, you need to be able to say, here's what I'm doing to make this church healthy. It doesn't have to be standing up in front of everybody and talking or teaching, but there needs to be some way that you are helping to make this place healthy. If not, I'm asking you to commit to do that. And we all the time think that it's got to be, oh, I've got to be teaching the Bible. That's a good thing to do. But I want to tell you, there's a guy, and if I said his name, he'd kill me and probably never come back. But there's a guy who has worked. Uh, he's up here almost as much as I am. And a lot of these things that you see happening around the buildings are because of this guy. He said to me, I don't want to stand in front of people. I will never do that. But this I can do. He's making the church healthier. That's what we need. That's what we need. And I'm asking you to consider what are you doing to make the church healthy.